Good afternoon, everybody. This is Robert Blevins from Adventure Books of Seattle, and we're here in Bonnie Lake, Washington today to uh, present some evidence in the D.B. Cooper case, and uh, we're going to be bringing on a, another gentleman pretty soon whose name is Kyle. And But before we get to that, we're going to tell you where we are and why we're here. And where we are is at D.B. Cooper suspect Kenny Christensen's old house in Bonnie Lake. And up here on the over here on this side of the screen here, you can see a sort of a round vent, and that's the spot where cast member Scott Roll from the show Brad Meltzer's Decoded found a hiding spot in the attic above Christensen's bedroom. Uh, that was covered with a uh, it was kind of a box they built or he built Kenny and covered with a piece of countertop that was taken from the house. Now uh, the reason that this relates to what we're going to do today because up on this area over here to my left, uh, a gentleman uh, and some of his friends found a large number of $20 bills buried in the ground. And an urban rumor's been going around about that, that money was buried on Kenny's property and found out after he died. But to date, uh, nobody's actually come forward to confirm that. But we're gonna, we're gonna do that today for you. And just stay tuned. Hi, my name is Kyle Dito Menes, and I'm here with Robert. Um, I contacted Robert after uh, watching the Decoded episode, and met, they mentioned us uh, on the Decoded, and I was uh, very surprised. So I, um, I tried to get a hold of Robert, and I did. So, um, yep, we are here at uh, Kenny's house, and this is where we found the money back in 98, 1998. Um, it was actually directly behind us here, uh, right near where the road is currently. Um, back in the day, we used to play all throughout the woods back there. Um, this particular time that we were out there, the woods had been clear-cutted, and um, there were uh, ex excavating out there and whatnot. So. Uh, we were still hanging out, we were still playing out there. Uh, we were kind of, we played a game called Manhunt, and uh, we would chase each other, and it was kind of like a hide-and-go-seek chase kind of a thing. So one of my friends was running down um, a hill that was right behind us, and he tripped over a piece of wood that was buried. Um, and it was all almost like a movie scene where you'd just seen a bunch of money fly up. Um, we went to it. Uh, and they were all $20 bills, marked uh, 86, 85 around. Um, and we took all the money. Uh, also, it was wrapped up in a plastic bag. Uh, not flimsy plastic, I mean very, very industrial plastic. Uh, so we took all that money, um, took it back over to my friend's house. Uh, and uh, showed his parents we kind of we were really close with that family so uh, you know we could trust the parents and stuff and and whatnot um, they took a picture of the money on it on their table their kitchen table and uh, that's the picture I presented to uh, Robert here Robert can pull it out sure. yep so that's the one uh, we took a picture of the money on the kitchen table. Um, they were, as you can see, it's it kind of, they're torn up a little bit. Some of them were, some of them were still intact, uh, but uh, definitely not in good shape. They were uh, buried for quite some time, you could tell. Um, so we, we took that money down to the police station, which is right across the street from here, um, turned it in. And then uh, they said they'll check it out and then um, give us fresh new bills if everything turns out. And that's what they did. Uh, we received uh, the fresh new bills probably two months later. Um, so uh, we received all fresh new bills. We split it amongst us. There were about six of us. Um, the funny thing is the next morning, um, 
there were quite a few kids in the neighborhood that we had we had told the story about, uh, and they went back and they tried to find money. Um, my brother was one of them. Uh, he he wasn't with us at the at the time that we found the money when my buddy tripped over it. Um, he came in uh, the next morning, probably about five o'clock. Tried to search for uh, money all over the all over the grounds back there. Uh, I think he found one twenty dollar bill, and, and that that was it. He he turned it in with the uh, with the money here, um, um, along with all of us. So uh, <clears throat> so yeah, he, nobody found money afterwards. Uh, we we found all the money that that day that we were out there. Um, I'd like to point yeah. out something in the uh, picture. It might be kind of hard to tell from this, but uh, and we'll try to do a better still for you. We'll incorporate it right into the video. But there's some baggies here. There's one here, one here, and some other baggies. And some of them are marked with the amounts that they had in. Like this one actually says forty dollars. Yeah. So some of the bills were actually in shards. Um, now, when you guys found the plastic bag, it, did it already have a hole in? It must have already been kind of. Yeah, it, it wasn't. It wasn't in good condition. So it's possible that maybe um, maybe a, a truck or something out there that that was doing a lot of the construction work uh, may, maybe was pushing it or something. It, it wasn't in good condition. Um, yeah, the money you could tell definitely was there for quite some time. It uh, it, it wasn't just uh, placed there recently. It was it was buried for quite some time. We're, we'd like to show you a picture of uh, this house and the property is uh, actually actually as it appears a lot different now. This is actually what it looked like back in 1972 when Kenny first bought the house. You can see that. You can see the hill above the house is uh, has all the trees and it hasn't been uh, had any uh, excavation done on it yet. And the money was was probably is hidden somewhere to the left out here in the picture, not up here. You know, at first we thought maybe if there was money, it was up here, because we had heard this story about money uh, years before uh, Kyle came along, and but we just didn't couldn't verify it until now. And uh, like this gentleman here, he used to, this is, uh, let me look here, this is Dan Rattenberg, and he's uh, the last one to live at this house full time. He ran a print shop here, and he told us that uh, clear back in 2010, that there was a rumor that money had been found out back at Kenny's house, but nobody could verify it. We also heard the same story from uh, the people who owned the house after Kenny died, the ones he left it to, and, uh, Robin Powell and Carolyn Tyner. Okay, so, and there is a couple of minor points I want to point out, I want to talk about Kenny, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, we hear a lot of stuff about Kenny's height, you know, that it doesn't, maybe doesn't match the hijackers because the official description says 5'10 to 6 foot, you know. But uh, what we heard from Jeff, Arthur Jeffrey Gray had the, got a look at the actual witness reports that were taken down by the FBI when he wrote his book, Skyjack. And what Mr. Gray found out was that the witnesses actually gave several different descriptions and they were all over the place. And one witness, one who was sitting almost right next to D.B. Cooper, when he was asked by the feds how tall Cooper was, he said, no taller than 5'9", not that tall, he said. Some of the other witnesses pegged him as high as six foot, six foot one. Now, here's a picture, I'm gonna hold it up a little closer. This was taken in 1954 of Kenny, and this is a picture of he and his father and his mother, and that's his the little baby there is his niece, Lynn. Now, as you can see, Kenny is actually taller than his father, but we know his father was 5'11", and Kenny was allegedly 5'8", but we, what we think is maybe he was a little taller, it's hard to say. He may have even shrunk himself an inch on his driver's license after the hijack. Can't be sure. Although I don't think he was anywhere near six feet. Anyway, um, I think that's all the pictures we're going to show right now. Maybe we'll take a walk around. And Well, how about one more? This picture hasn't been seen before. This is a picture of... Kenny Christensen and his brother Lyle when they were kids. It was probably taken about 1939. Now, as you can see, Kenny is actually taller than Lyle, even though he is older by a couple of years, but he's fairly tall. And anyway, I thought I just might want to see it sort of interesting. Let me go straight for you. Okay. Um, 
I think we're going to take a walk around and uh, look at the property, let you see some things. And then I'm going to add one more thing if I could. Oh, go ahead. Um, now, when we walk around here, everything has changed. Um, back, back in the day, everything was entirely different than what it looks like now. There's now a, a big road going through behind us. And um, so we'll kind of show you around the property here, but you also have to keep in perspective that the hills were much more defined. Um, and everything's kind of flattened out after they did so much work to this place. Um, so we'll show you around, but just keep in perspective, everything is pretty, it's kind of different. So um, back in the day, it was, it, it was uh, quite different. And we hope you can actually hear us on this video because it's been built up so much around here in Wine Lake that uh, there's a main road out here with a lot of traffic. So uh, we're trying to speak up. Maybe hopefully you can hear what we're actually saying. And there's some wind today too, but we're going to make the best of it. And uh, we'll be right back. This is Robert again, and uh, we just want, Cal and I just wanted to show you a general picture of what it looks like around here on Kenny's property today. Now, uh, it's been 46 years since Kenny actually bought this house, and I just want you to take a look. It's kind of, it's for sale right now, and it's kind of seen better days. You know, you can see fences falling down, and uh, somebody broke out the window over here and probably got in there. Over here, the back door where the print shop used to be. And up here you see a road, but before that it was uh, just woods and no road. And here's our friends at the Boyne Lake Police Department. We like them. And we'll go ahead and I guess that's, that'll cover it. Here's some woods up above the house. This is the spot where they filmed the uh, scenes from the show. Uh, what was it called? Um, show with Bethy Rossos. Yeah, anyway. That's it. Hi there, Kyle Dino Menace here again. Um, so we're here uh, right behind Kenny's house to show you where my friends and I found the money. So it was in this general direction right where the road is now. So this was all, there was more hills going on back then. Um, and even before that, the landscape of this area was entirely different. It was uh, all woods. All this was woods. Um, there was a little tiny trail coming down to where the main drag is right down here, the main road. But uh, yeah, it was just a small little trail and everything was woods. That was back in 97 when it was all woods, 96, I believe. Um, don't quote me on that, but that's kind of when we were kind of playing around in the wooded area. So afterwards, they excavated all this, uh, took out all the trees, and then all they left was just uh, mounds of dirt. Um, and that's what we were kind of playing, playing in at that point in time. Okay, hi, Kyle here again, um, here with Robert. Uh, quickly, I wanted to say that there was a Bank of America, which um, Seafirst was was the first one, and then they switched over to Bank of America. Um, we know that Kenny did a lot of transactions through Bank of America. Um, we know that his bank was actually down in Sumner. He probably established that before the hijacking and everything. Um, but I'm going to point out. Bank of America was also right over here where um, the grocery outlet is now. Uh, there's a new bank over there, I forget what the name is, but that's where um, he may have went over and did a couple of transactions. It was very close to the house. So We also know that uh, the hijacking ransom was paid by C First Bank, who later turned into Bank of America. And amazingly, uh, Kenny's house, which you can see right there, uh, half of it was actually financed by um, by Seafirst Bank, the same bank that paid off the hijacking ransom. And 
the bank being just down the street here, that would be where Kenny would probably make his mortgage payments. Now, uh, we, this, is a, this is just bizarre beyond belief, uh, really, that... <laughs> uh, so in a way, I guess the bank may have gotten some of their money back in interest payments over the years. I wanted to talk just for a moment about the upcoming movie that's coming on D.B. Cooper. Now, uh, I'm under a confidentiality agreement, so I can't tell you the name of the production company, but I can tell you one thing for sure. They're probably going to come here and do some filming uh, because this is Kenny's old house, and we're uh, in possession of enough evidence now that the production company wants to present Kenny, Kenneth Peter Christensen not as a maybe, not as a he might have been, but as a historical fact that he was, in fact, D.B. Cooper, the hijacker. And you'll know, they'll be coming to this house. Oh, I think they're coming to get Kenny now. No, wait, maybe not. Hi, uh, this is Robert again with Kyle, and uh, we're going to do a wrap-up here. Um, I think we've pretty much covered everything, although uh, we both decided during the intermission that it was pretty funny that that Sea First Bank used to be right up the street here, the same place that paid off the hijacking ransom in 1972, and it later became what, Bank of America? Bank of America after a while. Yeah. And that was pretty much, uh, I believe, one of the only banks around Bonnie Lake, so I didn't have too many options, but uh, yeah. Well, he also had an account down at the West One Bank later in life, and that's where, uh, where he left, where all this money was left to his brother. Uh, I think 180,000. Now that now, you know, we've had people. I've had people say to me, "Well, that can't be. You know, that's not from the hijacking ransom. Uh, Kenny sold off land. That's true. It is true that Kenny sold off land to make that money. But well, how he did it was after the hijacking. He had this 200,000 dollars in cash, and he probably laundered it overseas on some of his flights to Manila, Japan, and came back here and slowly invested. He bought this house. Uh, bought some property behind what's no, the old Bonnie Lake Safeway and uh, sold the trees off of that and made quite a bit of money later in life. But um, generally speaking, uh, you know, I've been working on this for about, oh, about nine years. I've come to the idea that Kenny was actually a pretty nice guy. I mean, most people said that. He was such a nice guy. And that he got desperate in 1971 and, and his friend Bernie Giesman uh, most likely was the instigator for the whole thing. Now we know that Giesman provided the means of transport, uh, a station wagon, and that uh, these two gentlemen spent the entire week of the hijacking together. Although uh, uh, Mr. Giesman went on the Decoded show and told the cast that, yeah, Kenny could be the hijacker because he looks just like him. The only problem with that is that several of Giesman's family members have uh, already testified that the two men were together the entire week of the hijacking. So my question was, why didn't Mr. Giesman offer Kenny an alibi since he was with him? Um, do you have any comments or questions about the case yourself? Um, not really. I mean, that's a, it's a it's a good point that uh, why didn't he offer an alibi? He just I mean, and that, I watched that on the uh, on the Decoded show, and that was and after you had sent me quite a few documents of what you were investigating and whatnot, I was. Uh, it, I, I kind of had to chuckle a little bit when I was watching that on the show um, because he was with um, with him the entire weekend of the hijacking. They were they were together. Mm -hmm. um, the family all, you know, they I guess they, he never missed a Thanksgiving with with them. If, if I remember That's true. right. That's so, And this was uh, one weekend where where they missed it. They mm -hmm. missed well, not weekend, but they missed a Thanksgiving together. And the family knew that, and they, they said that it was uh, very odd, so. There is one one uh, thing I do want to show the audience before we go, and uh, it's actually kind of funny in a way, but, you know, back in 1971, there was actually a statute of limitations on air piracy, there was, and it was five years. And, and then I, I discovered this letter that was mailed to Kenny on the same, well, it was postmarked on the same day that this statute was supposed to expire. And uh, it's, it's interesting because 
Kenny was going to celebrate his 25th anniversary with the airline, and he had uh, and receive an award and all this stuff. Yeah. yeah, here it is. Now you may have seen this on the internet, but it's better if you just look and I kind of read it to you because it's better that way. <laughs> it's a letter from the CEO of Northwest Airlines to Kenny, and if you can see the date, I'm not sure, but it says November 24th, 1976. That's the exact date that the, the statute of limitations would have expired on the hijacking. And after that, Kenny could have walked into any police station and plopped down one of the $20 bills and said, so what? You know, you, there's nothing you can do. And there probably wasn't anything they could do. The letter says, it's from the CEO to Kenny, says, Dear Mr. Christensen, I regret that you were unable to attend the 25-year service award banquet on November 13th. In recognition of your valuable and dedicated service to Northwest, I am sending you your 25-year service pin and a silver bowl. A souvenir program is enclosed with this letter. Congratulations and best wishes, MJ Lipinski. Uh, now, what's funny about this is that Kenny was invited to this somewhat before the statute ran out, but it was getting close. Now, if you were Kenny Christensen and the statute was approaching, about the last thing you'd really want to do is show up at a big meeting of Northwest Airlines noisy around here. Northwest Airlines employ employees, even if you got a free flight, he was going to get a free flight back to Minneapolis to go to the go to the, uh, the banquet. His family also lived not too far from Minneapolis and they would have shown up too. But Kenny wrote that whole thing up and you got to ask yourself why and I, we think it's because he didn't want to go to a place where a large number of NWA employees were going to be. Just on the off chance that somebody might might you know connect him with the hijacking? He had uh, up to that point he had been very low profile. Um, you know, we've talked to people he worked with. He was almost like a ghost, they said. So I, I see, I can see Kenny not going to the banquet, and he's waiting around for November 24th. So finally, when uh, that day comes, it's all over the Northwest news, all over the TV news, all over the newspapers. Guess what happened? Two FBI agents go to Portland, get in front of a federal judge, and get themselves a go right around that statute and get themselves a John Doe warrant. So I figure that on November 25th, 1976, that would be a very crushing day for Kenny Christensen because now he realizes that instead of being free and clear, like he's been looking forward to for five years, they're going to hunt him for the rest of his days. And uh, this letter is just something that rubbed it into his face. Um, I want to point out something also that we had discussed, um, you and I, in one of our meetings, and I, w I was wondering if maybe you wanted to go in depth on it. Um, the the kid down in Oregon, I believe it was Oregon, that found all the money um, on on the banks. Oh, the banks of the Columbia. The banks yeah. of the Columbia. Um, you you had a theory, and you know what? That I was thinking about that theory, and I think it's spot on. Um, I don't know what the timing when he found that money, but um, you believe that Kenny went down and dredged it into the river itself um, to kind of throw off the scent of uh, the FBI to make it look like or have rumors that he did not make it, um, that he had passed away and died. Um, and it was actually a very smart move on his on Kenny's part to dredge that money into the into the river bank. You mean like? Drop it, into drop it into the river yeah. and make it almost almost to a point where like people would find it. He wanted he wanted that money to be found. Um, and I, that was a pretty good theory on your part when you had mentioned that to me. Well, it's a pretty good it's a nothing but a theory, you know, but but kind of a I had a couple of different versions of it early on. And here we'll pick up our pictures for you. Okay, um, well at first I thought the money was, at first I thought, when I heard about this money find and I investigated, I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe somebody buried it at, the, at Tina Bar Beach. Yeah, but, after, but when I, more research was done, they found shards of bills at different depths, so it didn't make any sense that the money was actually buried. So, what I think happened was after the statute of limitations was bypassed by the FBI, at some point after that, Kenny took some of the money, maybe two or three bundles, and took it down there on his own and maybe put it in a bag or something and threw it in the river. 
hoping it would be found at some point. And that if they find it in the Columbia or on the banks of the Columbia, they're going to believe he's dead. But his plan didn't go exactly the way he wanted because what actually happened is the money sank and then it was eventually dredged up by the, the machines there that dredge up the channels in the river. And then where they found the money is where they used to dump the spoils. And uh, that's why there were some pieces found and some of the bills made it through the dredging. Up. So uh, maybe they didn't find it. He didn't find it the way he wanted to. But one thing it did do was after the money was found, uh, the FBI starts saying they thought the hijacker was dead. And they also scaled back their investigation quite a bit after the money find at Gene Ball. So maybe in a way, Kenny got what he wanted. That's about it. Yeah. yeah. And that was, I thought that was a brilliant, brilliant thing, a brilliant theory. Um, so, yeah. Well, do you have any other? Well, I just uh, keep a look out for uh, the movie. I, you know, we're under a confidentiality agreement. I can't tell you when or where it's going to happen, but uh, they're working on it now. Uh, I've seen what's called a teaser reel on it, and I showed it to Kyle as well. Yeah. And so other people have seen it. They, they kind of like it, but it's not a trailer. And it's also, uh, you know, teaser reels use material in them that uh, you can't really put on the internet. It's not allowed because sometimes they take little snippets from other films to make it. It's an in-house thing. They show it to potential directors, actors, crew members, producers, you know, to kind of get them interested in the movie. Um, so, I, unfortunately, I can't put that on the internet. Um, now, but uh, at some point, they're going to put out a trailer, and then we will announce it. Now, if you want to find out more information about all this or contact us personally, you can go to adventurebooksofseattle.com, and we got a D.B. Cooper page there, or you can go to adventurebooks.boards, Dot com. That's, I think it's dot .net actually. Adventurebooks.boards.net. That's, uh, that's at uh, ProBoards. And I understand. And there are links to all these places anyway. Our main homepage. Everything begins at adventurebooks.seattle.com. And you can find us there. We're also on Facebook and Twitter and the abusers. And I hope you found this video interesting. And, and uh, I want to thank you for watching. Thank you. Yes.